Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to uh, another webinar that I've put together. Um, the subject matter of um, the webinar is uh, leasehold reform uh, 2022. And what I propose to uh, speak to this afternoon are two new uh, aspects of uh, leasehold uh, law introduced uh, by statutes of 2022. Um, the first being the Leasehold Reform Ground Rents Act 2022, and the second being the Building Safety Act 2022. In the uh, usual way, for those who uh, have uh, attended my webinars before, I won't be able to speak to um, the entirety of this subject matter in the hour that we've got, um, but what I have prepared and what will be available to delegates um, are comprehensive notes which um, uh, sure as I can be, are uh, uh, cover all uh, that I speak to or uh, that are relevant to what I speak to um, uh, that, are, as I say, are available and have all the details. So there's no need to um, be concerned about making a note or anything of that nature. Again, in the usual way, I don't um, take questions during or immediately after the uh, webinar. Uh, the risk of tech failure at my end is far too great, but my email address is at the bottom of the papers and otherwise available on the Chamber's website. And I'm very happy to uh, address um, non-specific points uh, that any uh, delegates might wish to run past me arising out of the subject matter of, this, of the papers. Um, so with all that in mind, um, I would respectfully uh, remind you to put yourself on mute. Um, there's been one or two examples of quite, I think, quite funny noises in the background, but perhaps best not heard. And I'll turn now to the uh, first paper, which, as I've indicated, is the uh, <clears throat> concerns the leasehold reform ground rent acts uh, 2022, um, which has abolished certain ground rents. Um, the Act, uh, for the most part, commenced on the 30th of June 2022. I'll mention the exception to that commencement date uh, in, a, in a short while. The, the political background to this has been recent, uh, fairly recent um, comments in the press about um, sale of leasehold houses and uh, purchases being stung as they see it by um, uh, ground rents which they weren't expecting. The government have issued and published on the 23rd of this month, just before the Act came into force, guidance in which they say, amongst other things, that the Act was to make home ownership fairer and more transparent for future uh, leaseholders, uh, and that the reputation of leasehold system had been damaged by unfair practices uh, which have seen leaseholders contractually bound to pay onerous and escalating ground rents with no clear services in return and the act is to prevent this from happening in the future and uh, tackle significant ambiguity and unfairness for future leasehold owners Along, as long ago as 2015 an organization called leasehold knowledge partnership um, giving evidence before ministers said that uh, catching out aspirant first-time buyers who have spent many years in rented accommodation only to find that they are only long-term tenants in leasehold. Um, experiences differ. Um, I would be very surprised indeed if there are uh, many, if indeed any, purchasers of dwelling houses um, who are not properly advised as to the estate that they're buying, I'm certainly prepared to accept that many uh, purchasers um, don't fully grasp what owning a long lease uh, involves, but um, they should. Um, I can also um, readily understand that advice uh, given by um, conveyances about ground rents may not sometimes be um, complete. Clearly, if, if, if it, if a purchaser is not advised that he or she is purchasing a lease rather than a freehold estate, then the, the conveyancer has, I'm a been negligent. Um, 
whether the client understands what they're told is a different matter. <clears throat> um, also, solicitors or conveyances who don't tell the client that they have a ground rent obligation which um, provides for an increase in ground rent, we're probably negligent as well. As long ago as 1997, I uh, uh, argued a case in the Court of Appeal and at first instance in the year before that, um, where my clients all bought flats in a house or converted house in Hamilton Terrace in St. John's Wood, each instructing three different firms. And the ground rents at the time they um, acquired their leases, they weren't, some were assignments, I don't think anybody was a fresh grant, but at the time the ground rents were 300 odd pounds a year but the leases all had um, provisions for the increase in the rent. I remember they were contained in uh, rather complicated rent review clauses, about 14 lines long, which even to a non-practical conveyancer like me seemed to stand out as something that should be read carefully. And essentially what the rent review uh, clause did was it increased the ground rent to, a, I think it was a third of the rack rental value of the flat. And the reason for that was that these were all subleases and the heir estate had granted head leases of the house to two um, individuals who then granted the subleases. And the idea was to keep the uh, lease of the house outside the 1967 Act so that the, it could be enfranchised. And the, to do that, the rent was high. Um, so it was more than two thirds of the rental value on the appropriate day. So it drove all these tenancies into the Rent Act, notwithstanding they were long leases. But anyway, we successfully uh, sued the solicitors for not advising on that. But um, as I say, whatever the political or social reasons for the Act coming into force, it is with us now. Uh, and it does um, uh, create a, a split market, of course. Uh, I own a flat um, it pays uh, to pay a ground rent. But um, as we'll see, that won't be uh, the market in the future. Um, the first starting point is it applies to what are called uh, regulated uh, leases. And a regulated lease is a, a lease that satisfies the following requirements. So it's a, a lease of a single dwelling. It's granted for a premium. It's not often a requirement for qualification under these landlord and tenant statutes. It was granted on or after the relevant uh, commencement date. And when it was granted, it was not an accepted lease. The uh, expressions in um, italics are defined. Um, a, lease is a, a lease is a lease of law or equity and includes a sublease, but doesn't include a, a mortgage term. Um, a long lease, for the most part, is a term exceeding 21 years. Um, there are other definitions. Um, sorry, there are other ones that fall within the definition of long lease. That will, that will suffice. Um, um, a dwelling is a building or part of a building occupied or tended to be occupied as a separate dwelling together with any yard, garden, outhouse, and appurtenance usually belonging with it. A premium uh, means any pecuniary consideration for the grant of the lease or other than rent. So whilst it doesn't have to be valuable consideration, it's got to be pecuniary. So it, uh, a premium of um, Ford Cortina or something else uh, wouldn't do. It's got to have, uh, it's got to be money. And the relevant commencement date in relation to the lease is the date on which the act fully came in, into force in respect of the particular lease and for the most part that will be the 30th of June 2020 so we are now looking at um, uh, any new grants of long leases of a flat is going to be caught by the the act um, provision is made in the act in section 15 to deal with positions where um, a lease is an existing lease is varied and the effect of the variation is to operate as a surrender and regrant. Well, that new lease that arises on the regrant will be a regulated lease, um, notwithstanding that no premium is payable, um, provided it otherwise satisfies the requirements of a regulated, um, a regulated uh, lease. And 
that's what I've got on the screen now. Uh, as to accepted leases, there are five categories of accepted lease. Um, business leases, uh, five categories, yeah. Business leases, statutory lease extension, community housing leases, and home finance plan leases. Um, building leases definition is somewhat different than one ordinary fire is in such landlord and tenant statutes. It's often said that a, a business lease is a tenancy to which part two of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1954 applies, but that's not the position here. Um, uh, business lease is a lease where the terms expressly permit the de demise premises to be used for purposes which are business purposes as of right. So don't need the consent of the landlord for such use. The nature of the business per per permitted by the lease is such that use of premises demised by the lease as a dwelling significantly contributes to business purposes. So, albeit um, that um, what one has there is when one has, uh, not, perhaps not as common these days, but doctors or solicitors carrying on their, or other professionals carrying on their business in their house, um, that would take it outside the, uh, uh, that would make the lease an accepted lease. The third requirement is the land, landlord and tenant and, or prospective landlord and tenant each give each other a notice to the effect that the intended premises demise or to be demised um, are going to be used for business purposes. Um, there are regulations, uh, namely the leasehold reform ground rents business lease notice regulations, which prescribe what the uh, notices that the tenant and landlord must serve on each other um, must contain. I'm not going to speak to, to, to those um, provisions. I've set them out in the um, notes, which, as I say, uh, delegates will um, obtain. Um, statutory le lease extensions are outside the Act. Um, if it's granted under Part 1 of the 1967 Act of a house or under Part 2 of the um, uh, leasehold uh, Reform Housing and Urban Development Act 1993. Pause there for a second. Uh, my recollection is that certainly under the 1993 Act, um, all lease extensions are for a peppercorn in any event. So perhaps that doesn't um, uh, take one much further. And the, the, uh, another accepted uh, lease is community housing leases. And again, I, I su suggest that doesn't really arise very much in practice. So I won't speak to that in any great detail, albeit it is that it is. Um, covered in the notes. Um, the exception to the commencement of the Act um, in June of this year concerns retirement homes. Uh, and a lease is a lease of a retirement home if the terms of the lease are that the premises can only be occupied by persons who have obtained the age or the minimum age, and that minimum age is 55. In respect of leases of that accommodation, the uh, uh, Act bites from the 1st of April of next year. I don't quite know what the genesis of that is. I rather suspect is that the bid business model for retirement homes and the financing of it is very much tied up with uh, ground rent. So perhaps the uh, ground, uh, retirement home lobby um, achieved a little bit more breathing space um, in order to sort themselves out. But it could be no earlier than the 1st of April. Um, it's not certain that it will be the 1st of April. So um, getting to um, the, the meat of it, um, the Act outlines something called prohibited rent. And a prohibited rent is any rent to the extent that it exceeds the permitted rent. And the landlord under a regulated lease must not require the tenant to make a payment of prohibited rent by asking for a payment or having received a payment, failing to repay it within um, 28 days. Uh, in the Act, the word rent includes whatever it's called. Um, what is permitted is, and this is the general rule, the general rule is that the permitted rent is permitted and a permitted rent is a peppercorn rent. And a peppercorn rent means an annual rent of one peppercorn. Uh, I read somewhere that that's the first uh, statutory definition of a peppercorn rent, namely the annual rent of one peppercorn. Um, 
Uh, I believe that we all understand that you don't need a, a rent at all for the purposes of uh, creating a, a legal tenancy. Um, so it's quite interesting that one still has the comfort of the reservation of a peppercorn. Um, I don't suppose there'll be a run on the market of peppercorns, but uh, we at home have got loads of them, so we'll be all right. Um, Section five of the Act gets a little bit more complicated now, is concerned with um, relevant shared ownership leases, which is a regulated lease. And a shared ownership lease is a lease granted um, on the, for a premium calculated by reference to a percentage of the value demised or the cost of providing them, or under which the tenant uh, may be entitled a sum calculated by reference to the value of the premises. And essentially what the Act says is that in respect of the tenant's share, um, of the lease, um, if it's something less than 100%, uh, then the tenant's share of the rent, it can only ever be a peppercorn, and uh, the, the, the rent is, um, the rest of the rent is payable by the landlord. And there are quite um, detailed provisions as to how that um, all works, which I say are set out in the, in the uh, notes. Um, what's the effect? if? If, God forbid, somebody uh, seeks to grant a lease reserving a prohibited rent going forward, well, there's a table which I've set out in the notes, at section seven, um, that provides for the maximum rent permitted by section two. So if there's a grant of a lease which purports to grant, uh, sorry, reserve a rent in excess of the permitted rent, the rent, the, the act operates to uh, change the terms of the lease in respect of rent um, to reserve only a peppercorn. And the table sets out how it, the general rule, shared ownership re, uh, leases, replacement leases, and so on and so forth. And as I say, the maximum permitted rent is uh, a peppercorn. There are enforcement uh, provisions, uh, provisions for penalties to be imposed on landlords and for the recovery of um, um, uh, prohibited rent and interest. Um, it, it's the local weights and measures who have the power to enforce, um, or a district council, if a district doesn't have a weights and measures office, query how much uh, time or other resources such um, public bodies will have to chase after those who have unlawfully sought to um, recover or keep um, rent in excess of the um, maximum rent. Um, financial penalties may be imposed by those uh, enforcement bodies. It's under a duty to impose a financial penalty on a person if they're satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that the person is in breach of section 3.1. That's a section that doesn't, that provides that nothing more than a permitted rent can be recovered. And it's for the local authority to determine the amount. It can't be less than 500 pounds and it can't be more than 30,000 um, pounds. Not clear what criteria would be used by the local authority. I suppose if one has a, uh, a, a an habitual offender, um, the, the, the fine or the financial penalty, forgive me, will be, uh, higher. The schedule to the Act contains provisions for the procedure for imposing financial penalties. Um, again, it's, it's very turgid stuff. I'm not speaking to it now. I've set out the schedule as an appendix to the paper, but it um, provides for the, the authority to serve notice and so on and so forth and submissions on, and responses and so on and so forth. And for the purposes of um, enforcing um, these obligations and for imposing penalties, um, the enforcement authority has the investigatory powers conferred upon such bodies by the Consumer Credit Act 2015. Um, again, I'm not, uh, I haven't set them out in the, in the paper, uh, but reference could be had to that act um, if one finds oneself concerned with the enforcement of this. Perhaps more usefully, we'll have to see, is um, provisions in the Act, uh, Section 10, which provides for the recovery. Um, uh, an enforcement authority may obtain an order that certain persons pay to the tenant an amount of prohibited rent which, rent which has not been enforced, and 
on this basis, um, if this is the route that the enforcement authority uh, go down, then they um, need only show on a balance of probability that a tenant has made a payment of uh, a prohibited rent and it's not been uh, paid back. Um, the person clearly who um, is liable to make the payment is the landlord, but it stretches further. Um, it's the landlord under the lease at the time the payment was made, the landlord under the lease at the time the enforcement authority makes the order, or where the payment was made to a person acting on the landlord's behalf, that person. Um, again, Schedule 9 to the, oh, sorry, forgive me, the schedule to the Act contains the procedure for the um, enforcement authorities to um, seek an order for the recovery of money paid and the investigatory powers conferred by the 2015 Act um, are available in this context also. Interest. Um, when a, an order is made for uh, an amount to be repaid under Section 10.2, the authority can also make provision for uh, interest. It's the interest rate that applies to uh, judgment debts. So it's now 8%, which is still, I think, after this morning, a still pretty decent rate. Um, and it's payable from the date when the tenant paid the rent until the date the sum is paid back. And there's provisions which deal when, with cases where there's been more than one payment of prohibited rent and so on and so forth. Another way forward is um, recovery of prohibited rents by tenants. This is section 13. Um, the tenant may apply to the appropriate tribunal for a recovery order. And, and a recovery order is an order requiring the person specified in the application to pay the tenant before the end of 28 days beginning with the date that that order is made, the amount of the prohibited rent that has not been uh, refunded. The person who may be the subject of such an order is the landlord under the lease when the payment is made, the landlord under the lease the application was made if there's been an assignment on, or where the payment is made to somebody acting for the landlord, uh, that person. And again, um, provisions are made in the act, which I address in the paper uh, as to the jurisdiction of the tribunal as the first tier tribunal in uh, England and the leasehold valuation tribunal in Wales to um, make provision for the recovery of uh, various amounts of um, overpayment if you will by the uh, tenants. Section 13 operates without prejudice to any other remedy the tenant might have an obvious cause of action is um, recovery of money made under a mistake. I don't know whether a simple claim in the county court would be quicker on that, for, on the basis of that cause of action would be quicker than applying to the um, tribunal, um, more and more uh, jurisdiction conferred upon the first tier tribunal, so um, really quite busy. Um, the tribunal can award interest on the same basis that we um, looked at under section 11 and there's a, a, a cap on the total amount of interest that can be paid. There's also um, another jurisdiction that's been conferred upon the tribunal by the uh, Act and that's that either the landlord or the tenant can apply to the appropriate tribunal for a declaration as to the effect of section seven on the terms of the lease. That's the section that says that under the under a lease which reserves something more than a permitted rent, the lease is varied so as to only allow the peppercorn to be recovered. Um, and essentially what this jurisdiction allows the tribunal to do is to declare, declare how the lease will work, not just in respect of the, the reservation and rent or the covenant to pay the rent or interest or other, but anything else in the lease that might be adversely affected by or affected in any way by the um, operation of Section 7. And there's a dispute as to the land and between the landlord and the tenant as to what that effect is. And they can adjudicate, they being the tribunal, can adjudicate on how the lease will operate going forward, having regard to the provisions of the Act. And if the lease is um, registered, um, 
the uh, landlord must, if ordered by the leasehold valuation tribunal, sorry, forgive me, the first tier tribunal, apply for a declaration to be entered on the registered title uh, if the, the landlord the tribunal doesn't um, so uh, order or the landlord just doesn't bother, then the tenant can. And of course, it's open to the tenant to apply, even if the landlord is disappeared uh, and get the uh, its lease clarified, if that's the right way of putting it, uh, going forward. Um, the administration charges for peppercorn rents, uh, paragraph 2A of Schedule 11 to the uh, Common Hold and Leasehold Reform Act 2002 provides, this has been inserted by the 2022 Act, that no administration charge is payable for or in connection with or respect of the payment of a relevant rent and a relevant rent is a rent or any part of a rent, but which by uh, virtue of um, the act is a peppercorn. So um, wily landlords can't um, extract money from tenants for the purpose of trying to um, receive payment of the peppercorn. Um, so if the landlord wants to knock itself out by uh, making such a spurious claim, then it has to do it at its own expense. I can't imagine that that will ever happen, but what do I know? Um, three miscellaneous points. Um, by section 19, um, section 19 of the uh, of the 2002 Act amends the Housing Act 1985 to reflect the fact that going forward that some uh, dwelling houses that would other, otherwise fall within the right to buy legislation will reserve only a peppercorn rent. Section 19 ensures that they still fall within them, notwithstanding that they don't have um, a substantial rent. Um, section 23.1 provides the Act applies to Crown land, and I won't go into the detail of that. You see it's, it's, it's on the notes and in the screen. And um, as has been clear from what I've said above, um, said earlier, the Act only applies to England and Wales. Um, I repeat, um, the detail um, over and above that, which I've mentioned, is contained in the, uh, the notes, which will be available to the uh, delegates. Um, on that quick run through, we'll move on to the Building Safety Act 2022. Um, and I'm calling this remediation costs under qualifying leases. Um, section one of the this 2022 Act contains an overview of the Act in the modern drafting style. And it says that the Act has six parts, contains provisions intended to secure safety of people in, build, in or about buildings and improve the standard of buildings. And it's um, absolutely right to say that the bulk of this very long and detailed act is concerned with building safety. Um, um, and of course, it arises out of the tragedy back in 2017 at the Grenfell Tower. Uh, the, um, in the context of a, a leasehold reform um, webinar, I shall be concentrating only on um, the provisions of part five of the act which um, are unhelpfully uh, entitled other provisions about safety standards, etc. cetera. Um, and essentially what it provides is that the sections 117 to 125 in Schedule 8, 8 make provision in connection with the remediation of relevant defects in relevant buildings. Well, what they do is in fact uh, address who pays for these remediation works rather than um, what it is that the works have to be in any specific sense. Essentially, these provisions uh, concern, for the most part, the payment and recovery of service charges. So that's what I will um, be uh, concentrating on uh, this afternoon. And you'll remember we've, we've all um, seen the uh, items in the press and news media about... Um, unfortunate uh, people who have got flats they can't sell and plummeted in value and uh, and so on and so forth because of cladding and being faced with um, ruinous um, serv ser service charge bills. The relevant provisions I'm concerned with came into force on the 28th of June 2022. And again, uh, I think somebody else has got their microphone on if they could please turn it off. Um, the much of the uh, meat of um, the statutory provisions concerning remediation costs are contained in these two sets of regulations, which are on the screen now, the 
protections um, regulations and the information uh, regulations, um, they are pretty turgid stuff. And in, I certainly found one um, error in it. Uh, it's just a, a mis cross reference. Um, but um, I'm afraid if one is concerned with uh, a case arising uh, within the provisions of this part of the 2020 Act, 22 Act, one is going to have to get down and dirty, if I can put it that way, with these uh, provisions. The starting point, as is so often the case with these new um, statutory provisions, are uh, basic definitions. And there are five, I think it is, yes, five, which you'll see on the screen now, which are at the core of it. And the substance of the uh, Act doesn't make sense without having an understanding of what these definitions mean. And of course, the first is a um, uh, definition that I must uh, speak to is a relevant building. And a relevant building is a self-contained or self-contained part of a, being, a building in England that contains at least two dwellings. Now, pause there for a second. It's got to have two dwellings in it. It doesn't have to have uh, exclusively dwellings in it. Um, but anyway, it's got to be over a, at least, forgive me, 11 metres uh, high or has five storeys, um, whichever is the lower, I suppose. Um, a relevant building, even if it's at least 11 metres tall, it's got two dwelling houses and it's at least five storeys tall, um, it doesn't include, the definition doesn't include um, a building in relation to which the tenants have exercised the right of first refusal under part one of the um, Landlord and Tenant Act 1987, or their right of compulsory acquisition under part three of the 1987 Act. It doesn't, um, a relevant building is not a building, the freehold of which the tenants have acquired having exercised the right of a collective enfranchisement under the 1993 Act. And um, a relevant building is not a building, the freehold of which is leaseholder own, owned, leaseholder owned within the definition um, in regulations made by the Secretary of State. And a, a relevant building that is common, held as common hold, sorry, a building that's held as common hold is not a relevant building. The purposes of all of that, well, it's section 117 three is to exclude from the provisions of the act um, those buildings where the tenants have bought their freeholds. So if they've, um, if they've done that, and there's a lot of uh, such buildings, then none of this, um, none of these provisions um, restricting the recovery of service charges will apply to such a building. The um, provisions in the act explain what self-contained is and self-contained part is, self-contained if it's structurally detached, and self-contained uh, part is a part that can be, is a vertical division of a building, um, could be redeveloped um, independently, and the services that just provide uh, exclusively to that part. It's a formulation that's been used in many of the um, uh, landlord and tenant statutes in the last 20, 20 odd years. And relevant services for these purposes, again, is always pipes, cables, and other fixtures. So that's a, the building. And there's got to be a qualifying lease. Uh, remember, one is focusing on an, an obligation of a tenant to pay service charges under his or her lease. So it's got to be a lease in a, a building that we've just looked at, and it's got to be a qualifying lease. And it's got to be a long lease of a single dwell, dwelling in a relevant building. The tenant must be obliged to pay a service charge. The lease was granted before the 14th of February, 2022. So it, it works as it were retrospectively. Um, and at the beginning of 14th of February, 2022, the dwelling was the relevant tenant's only or principal home. The relevant tenant didn't own a d another dwelling house in the UK or the relevant tenant own no more than two dwellings in the UK, apart from the interest under the lease. That's, I assume, in... <coughs> again, another, another microphone, please. Uh, uh, that's 
I assume, intended to exclude um, institutional landlords from, um, sorry, institutional owners of leasehold flats um, from uh, benefiting from uh, this. Um, a long lease is a term granted for a term of years exceeding 21. A person owns a dwelling, they have a, an interest or a, in it, either freehold or leasehold. A service charge has the same meaning as given by Section 18 of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1985. So again, without going into the details orally, we're familiar with what that means. Uh, a relevant defect, we move on to the third uh, term, relevant defect in relation to a building means a defect as regards the building that one arises as a result of anything done or not done or anything used or not used in connection with the relevant works and it causes a building safety risk and relevant works and safety building risks are also defined the relevant works are works in relation to the construction or conversion of the building if the construction or conversion was completed in the relevant period the works undertaken or commissioned uh, by the landlord, if the works were completed in the relevant period, um, works undertaken at the end of the relevant period to remedy a, a relevant defect. And in the Act, the relevant period is the period commencing the 28th of June 1992. So it's the 28th of June 1992 to February 2022. So essentially, if you've had got a new build, a uh, conversion of an existing building, and if that has a relevant uh, defect, um, then it's caught by these provision. A relevant risk is a building safety risk that arises as a result of a relevant defect. And something called a relevant measure is in relation to a defect, a measure undertaken to remedy the defect uh, for the purposes of preventing a relevant risk from materialising or reducing the sever severity of any incident resulting from a relevant risk materialising. So it's um, to reduce the, the relevant risk. I can see a lot of dispute as to what is a relevant measure and whether um, these provisions are satisfied at all. Um, but... I can see it's, it's going to be a minefield, whatever um, the legislature did. So now turning to the um, first substantive part, and these are all paragraphs in Schedule 8 to the 2020 Act. And paragraph two provides that no service charges are payable for defects which the landlord or an associate of the landlord is responsible. And it applies to a lease of any premises in a relevant building. And of course, it, therefore, it applies to non-dwellings, uh, sort of commercial units on the ground floor. Um, a person is responsible for um, the uh, defect if it, it's an, an initial defect, namely if the uh, building was constructed or converted by that person and it had a defect, and there's a, a definition of developer and associated and so on and so forth, so that it's very widely um, uh, cast, and regulations make provision for um, when uh, for non-residential uh, tenants have to pay uh, service charges, and uh, provisions are also contained in the regulations um, for the recovery of amounts by landlords from other landlords, putting it simply, um, if the immediate landlord of the tenant can't recover a service charge, he or she can't be liable to any superior uh, uh, um, landlord up, up a chain. Um, so if the paragraph two is satisfied, no service charges are payable in respect of this element of the larger service charge bill. This is a, Tenants will still have to pay for the gardening and the caretaker or whatever it is they pay their service charges for, but not for works that are the responsibility of the landlord or somebody in associate um, with the landlord. Paragraph three provides that no service charge is payable under a qualifying lease in respect of a relevant measure, which we looked at, relating to any defect it, 
if the landlord under the lease at the qualifying time, the relevant landlord, meets the contribution condition. And essentially what this means, if the landlord has a lot of money, um, then the tenants don't have to pay if they would otherwise have to pay. And the, the contribution condition is the landlord's group. So it's not just looking at the, the, uh, the named landlord necessarily, if its net worth is more than N times 2 million pounds, where N is the number of relevant buildings that the, the landlord has. Um, so again, landlords with deep pockets, um, they can't recover service charges from tenants who otherwise might be liable to pay for such works, even if those landlords were not liable under paragraph two, because they didn't create the building or, 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 or carry out the necessary works, which were defective. Uh, this paragraph doesn't apply, obviously, to certain public landlords, such as local authorities and uh, housing, uh, social housing providers and anybody else that the Sec Secretary of State prescribes by regulations. And um, there's a presumption that a landlord under a qualifying lease at the qualifying time meets the contribution condition unless the landlord proves that provides the tenant with a certificate that the, does, the landlord doesn't meet the qualifying condition. So there's an onus on the landlord to stump up information uh, to satisfy the tenant that it doesn't have um, a net worth to satisfy this requirement. And again, there are uh, tedious um, provisions in the regulations um, which um, provide for uh, content and form of any such certificates. The, Next exclusion is um, paragraph four, and that is there's no service charges payable under a qualifying lease in respect of a relevant measure relating to any relevant defect if the value of the qualifying lease at the qualifying time was less than £325,000 in uh, Greater London and £175,000 in any other case. And there are detailed provisions as to uh, how one works out the value of the uh, qualifying lease. Um, and it's expressly provided that it's got to include uh, ascertainment, the consideration given on the last assignment, um, and so on and so forth. Um, again, detailed provisions as to the formula to be applied for the um, calculation of that um, value. Um, I don't know, um, I'm not a practical conveyancer, but just um, £325,000 doesn't buy one much of a lease, dare I say it, in, in Greater London. So it may well be that paragraph four um, has um, of limited um, application, but it is there nevertheless. So if, if those are extremely uh, modest uh, flats in, in London, I don't know what 175 would buy outside of Greater London, various respect around the country, um, they won't have to make any contribution at all. Paragraph five makes provision for um, limits on service charges in other cases. Um, a service charge which would otherwise be payable under a qualifying lease in respect of a relevant measure relating to a relevant defect um, can't exceed the permitted maximum and the permitted maximum is £15,000 in Greater London and £10,000 um, elsewhere. However, if the lease is worth more than a million, but less than two, the maximum is pushed up to £50,000 in Greater London. Um, and if the value of the lease exceeds £2 million, the permitted maximum is £100,000. And there are provisions um, in the uh, Act dealing with uh, shared ownership leases. Um, again, the details are in the notes, but I won't speak to, to that. Um, again, experiences may differ, but um, at two, uh, two million pounds, we're not talking about um, penthouses on Park Lane. That's not even close to um, flats in, in, in that part of town. And be it fifty thousand pounds or one hundred thousand um, pounds, for many of us, that's a, a mighty 
uh, some to find or potentially find. Um, but again, all of this is, is, is somewhat of a compromise. So um, there we are. There's an, oh, an annual limit on uh, paragraph seven on service charges. It places a limit on something called relevant service charges, which are service charges on the qualifying lease, again, in respect of a relevant measure applying to a relevant defect. Um, the permitted maximum is um, that which I've uh, explained under paragraph six. So they can't exceed um, 15 in London, 10 in London, moving up to 50 and 100, uh, as I've just uh, described. Um, here's, 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 excuse me, here's the, uh, the money shot, as it were. It's paragraph eight. Um, it provides that no service charge is payable under a qualifying lease in respect of cladding remediation. And cladding remediation means the removal or replacement of any cladding system that forms the outer wall of an external wall system and is unsafe. So all the other criteria for qualifying uh, for the restrictions on the service of uh, service charges have no relevance to um, uh, cladding works. Um, it, it simply provides that the, the tenants don't have to pay uh, service charges. So in the, in the context of cladding, one um, only has to establish that the tenant is a tenant under a qualifying lease in a relevant building. And then the, the landlord has to um, stump up the entirety of the cost of such cladding works. And today, um, on my way to the um, station, the tube station, I walked through a development of, I think there are three very substantial blocks um, completed in the last 10 years, um, two of which have got to my untrained eye cladding on the outside of them. And for the last N months, there's been um, men with cherry pickers, substantial cherry pickers uh, over the uh, sides of these, the external walls of these buildings, removing bits of cladding. Um, I haven't seen any wholesale replacement work being taking place uh, thus far, but these intrusive investigatory works have been carried on for a number of months now. Um, well, if, it, if they're cladding works and the leases are relevant leases, and I suspect they are, and it's certainly a relevant building, um, then the landlord's going to have to tr trump up for, for, for that. Um, paragraph nine um, prov provides that no service charge is payable under a qualifying lease in respect of legal or other professional services relating to the liability or potential liability of any person incurred in the relevant defect. Uh, so obtaining legal advice, any proceedings before a court or tribunal, arbitration or mediation. So that provides, I suggest, uh, a fair degree of protection from uh, for tenants from um, uh, threatening um, action by landlords. You know, if you don't pay, we'll take you to court and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, they, if they do that, of course, the tenants will have to pay, if it's a tribunal case, have to pay their own costs unless the landlord's guilty of unreasonable behaviour. But um, the landlord certainly can't run an argument that, to investigate the condition of the cladding, um, that costs money and therefore the tenant has to pay that. Um, what does um, no service charge payable, what does that mean? It's, moved, it's used many times in the um, in the Act, and I've used it many times myself. Uh, paragraph 10 of Schedule 8 to the 2022 Act explains what that means. It means no cost incurred or to be incurred in respect of a thing or in respect of the thing and anything else, which is um, very, very helpful. Um, and that concludes... Um, any costs to be met from a, a re relevant reserve fund. So if rather than levying um, uh, a service charge as part of the annual service charge in respect of uh, relevant works to a relevant defect, the landlord wants to dip into a re fund, res relevant reserve fund, that is all that dipping in is also prohibited by the 2002 Act. Um, and um, 
a relevant fund for, for these purposes is a trust fund within the meaning of section 42 of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1987. You remember that that imposes a trust on landlords in respect of uh, service charges held by them. An express trust, if there is of that nature, um, any, and any other fund comprising payments made by the tenant under a lease and others and held for the purpose of meeting costs incurred or to be incurred in respect, <laughs> in respect to the relevant building in question or any part of it. Um, the, sec the Secretary of State may by regulations modify the application of paragraph 10 in respect of non-residential leases. So again, um, in a building that has mixed user, um, there is some um, provisions that protect um, the commercial occupiers of space in the uh, building. Where an amount called the original amount would apart, um, would apart from Schedule 8 be payable by a tenant under a lease in a relevant building, and a greater amount would, apart from Schedule 8, be payable under the lease as a result of the schedule, the lease has effect as if the amount payable were the original amount. And what that tongue twister means is this, that the costs that the landlord can't recover from a tenant under a qualifying lease of a, in a dwelling, he can't seek or she can't seek to recover those costs from a tenant who doesn't benefit from um, the protection of the 2022 Act. That other tenant might have to pay towards curing a re relevant defect. But what he can't be obliged to do is pay for a share of the tenants who don't have to pay. So if I'm liable to pay for remedial works and my service charge is a thousand pounds, I can't, that sum, that sum can't be increased because the landlord can't recover the thousand pounds from the five other tenants in the building. So mine will only ever be a thousand pounds in respect of these remedial works. And it goes, I hope it goes without saying, because uh, although it's easy to lose sight of the fact that these provisions only impact on the costs, the remediation costs that we concerned with and we dealt with at the beginning of this second paper. So I repeat, in respect of other elements of the service charge account, um, the tenants of course remain liable to, to, to pay those. Um, miscellaneous points, uh, paragraphs 15 and uh, 16 of the uh, various regulations make provision for the exchange of information between landlords and tenants. It will be uh, clear, well, certainly when you read the notes, but um, let me tell you, it's clear that a lot of these provisions uh, can only be relied upon if the tenants in particular have information about their landlord. And you know, without um, uh, statutory assistance under the uh, regulations, uh, the landlord could simply say, mind your own business. Um, but the uh, Act does make um, provision again for the Secretary of State to make uh, regulations, and they have, uh, or the Secretary of State has, and they are uh, the reference to those provisions I set out in the note. And the final provision I wish to um, raise is that there's no contracting out of the provisions of Schedule 8. Uh, a covenant or agreement, whenever made, is void insofar as it purports to exclude or limit any provision made under Schedule 8. Um, I'm afraid that there's no avoiding getting one's head stuck into the provisions of Part uh, 5 of the 2022 Act and Schedule 8 if one has a case uh, arising or potentially arising uh, under it. I can see some substantial complications with um, uh, service charge accounts to trying to identify and extract um, service charges that are being claimed in respect of uh, relevant works which are prohibited under part five. One would like to think that um, the uh, 
restrictions on the recoverability of service charges under the Landlord and Tenant Act 1985 and the um, consultation requirements will make it somewhat easier for tenants to um, identify what uh, expenditure would fall within the provisions of the 2022 Act. Um, but notwithstanding um, very, very comprehensive provisions, uh, I can see there being uh, quite a lot of scope for um, dispute as between landlords and tenants going forward. Um, when I say going forward, the disputes will arise going forward. As I've explained, uh, none of this applies to um, qualifying leases that came into existence after February of this year. And um, I haven't looked very hard, but I, I haven't uh, come across why February uh, 2022 is the relevant date. It may well have something to do with compensation funds or something, I don't know. But as I say, um, the notes that I prepared for both the first paper and the second paper will be available, uh, well, they're available now. And um, I repeat, I'm very happy to address general points um, if you send them to me in an email. And I wish to thank you again for spending uh, time with me this afternoon dealing with what's pretty turgid stuff. But I, I felt obliged to um, enlighten myself, if nobody else, about the provisions of these new acts. Um, and we'll see how far uh, we have to spend any of our professional time going forward dealing with these issues. Uh, please enjoy the rest of your uh, afternoon. Um, there'll be further details or details of further webinars will be posted on our website um, uh, shortly and no doubt you'll be troubled by um, unsolicited mail shots from chambers telling you about them. Uh, good afternoon.